Okay, thank you all for joining us again for our next panel on atrocities prevention. I'm so pleased to introduce the moderator. We're very uh, happy to have with us uh, Michael Abramowitz, who after a distinguished career in journalism, became the director of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Committee on Conscience, a body with whom Human Rights First works very closely. The Committee on Conscience is charged with educating policymakers in the public about genocide and other crimes against humanity and seeking action to prevent those crimes. He's going to introduce our distinguished panelists and we're going to have a great discussion. So thank you all for being here and thanks, Mike. Over to you. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Alyssa, for a kind introduction. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with Human Rights First, which as uh, Alyssa said, we work closely with. Uh, Tad and the rest of the team there on the Crimes Against Humanity program. I'd also like to put in a plug for our, the chairman of our museum who is uh, in the audience, Tom Bernstein. He's kind of dual-hatted. He's a friend of uh, the museums and also uh, he's a deep friend. He's our chairman, but he's also uh, obviously a strong supporter on the board of Human Rights First. Uh, Alyssa, Alyssa did a good job of saying essentially what our mission at the museum is in terms of, the, in terms of trying to assist in the prevention of future genocides and crimes against humanity. And it's an important uh, subset of the broader human rights agenda, which you're discussing yesterday and today here at the uh, museum. Uh, one of the points that I thought I'd like to make is that uh, what's interesting about the issue of, and disturbing about the issue of genocide and crimes against humanity is that often presidents come into office not thinking this is going to be on their agenda. It's not part of uh, their campaign platform. It's not part of uh, uh, typically what they think about. But this issue tends to come up again and again. And if you just look at the history of the past 20 years with Rwanda, uh, Bosnia, Darfur, and then today with the uh, crises in uh, Syria, in Sudan, just the events of the last couple weeks in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that this is an issue that comes up again and again, even though policymakers don't, uh, uh, don't think about it. And one of the things that's also interesting is that over the last 20 years, I think there's been considerable efforts that we have to recognize to try to deal with this as a problem. Obviously, it's hard to look at the kinds of atrocities that have taken place and not say there have been failures. But I think the world is starting to try to take this more seriously. We now have the first permanent uh, tribunal in The Hague, the International Criminal Court, and other tribunals to, uh, to try the perpetrators. Uh, we, have a, we have a new concept uh, that is taking uh, some root in the world, the responsibility to protect doctrine. And we also uh, have here in the United States, and I think it's really a bipartisan issue, uh, the, the beginning to, uh, of the creation of, uh, of structures and tools to deal with this. Uh, the museum a few years ago brought together with the U.S. Institute of Peace and some other institutions a genocide prevention task force, bipartisan task force chaired by Madeleine Albright and, and William Cohn. They came up with a bunch of recommendations which now are really the, uh, the, the model for what the Obama administration is doing. So, uh, so I, 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 it's hard to sometimes look at the glass as and say this is success, but I do think that we're moving in the right direction. We have two tremendous guests, uh, uh, panelists, to talk about this issue with us today. Two of my favorite people and people that the museum works very closely with. Uh, to my right is Rich Williamson. Rich was the former special envoy for Sudan uh, under President George W. Bush. He served also in uh, two previous Republican administrations in very senior jobs, and he's just off the campaign trail as a senior advisor to Governor Romney during his presidential campaign. To my left, we have Nancy Soderberg, who uh, was a senior official both at the National Security Council and at the United Nations under the uh, Clinton administration. Uh, she now uh, runs the Connect U.S. Fund, uh, which is uh, devoted to engaging uh, uh, U.S. In, uh, uh, in the world. Um, both Nancy and Rich are members of, a, of our Responsibility to Protect Working Group at the museum. We're going to come out with some recommendations in the next couple months. Both also have a great blend of idealism and practicality. And so I think it's a really great uh, group to kind of discuss a very important subject. So I'm going to sort of uh, guide them through a couple of, uh, about a half hour or so of, of questions, and then we're going to try to open this up to the audience. And I think it would be very difficult 
uh, to have a conversation today about mass atrocities without really focus on what's happening in Syria. 40,000 civilian deaths, uh, crimes against humanity, certainly. I would argue there's a risk of genocide in the, in the months ahead. Uh, there, it's not the only crisis we have. As I said, the Democratic Republic of Congo is really very serious and heating up in recent weeks. So I'd like to start with Rich first and ask you, as you look at the issue of Syria in particular, but you can but feel free to bring in some other uh, 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 crises, uh, why is it so difficult, uh, where is the political will, do you think, to deal with these uh, kinds of uh, looming threats to humanity? Well, first let me just thank Mike and Alyssa and uh, acknowledge my friend Nancy Soderberg, who's done a lot in this and other areas of U.S. foreign policy. Um, I fear we'll agree 80 percent, so it won't be as interesting as it might be here today. Um, I think Syria is a demonstration of the political costs of engagement. I believe after uh, the Bush administration's poor handling of post-conflict Iraq and Afghanistan, there was an enormous fatigue. And this was um, evident in President Obama's foreign policy. So it's a reluctance more generally to be as involved. Add to that <clears throat> that you've got uh, not a lot of political capital you gain by getting engaged in these things, and huge risk. And that also is a cautionary tale. And third, it brings home that Libya really was a unique circumstance. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi, <clears throat> who really is quite a remarkable person, because he had all this oil wealth for 30 years and managed to make sure he had no friends in the world. And there, therefore, once uh, the uprising began there, it was easy to unify the Arab community, the African community, and eventually uh, the world community to take action. Uh, when, you know, as I'm sure Nancy had this experience in various diplomatic roles, when you spent time in Egypt or Tunisia or sub-Saharan, usually a question with a head of state it would be, and what's Gaddafi up to? Why is he sending money down here to some troublemakers or whatever? And so uh, when uh, Muammar Gaddafi got in trouble, uh, he didn't have friends, so it was easier to get international support to take action. Second, he telegraphed what he would do by using language which was so inflammatory, as opposed to uh, Bashir al-Assad, who has always said, no, no, I really want to work this out publicly as he's doing these atrocities and awful things um, at the same time. And uh, third, you had in particularly France, a country that was really pushing hard for action. And then because of the geography of Libya and where the uh, division was between the East and West, a capacity to uh, provide military action on a no-fly zone and to stop supply routes where most of it didn't endanger s civilians. So all those factors contributed to making it not an easy case, but an easier case than you normally would. And I give the president and his team, Samantha and others, uh, great credit for how they addressed uh, the Libyan issue. Um, and I thought it was very commendable, but I do think it raised false expectations in future cases. I think Syria is more typical, where it's messier. You've got a government with lots of friends, and particularly for, uh, for Syria in the case of Iran and Russia. You have an administration which understandably doesn't want to risk that much. Uh, the American public that isn't that engaged. And um, frankly, I, I don't mean to be too harsh, but I think there's a decision not to act. And so I think Nancy's experienced this too up at USUN. When you don't act, when you really don't want to do anything, you say, okay, we'll take it to the UN. Which is really a posture, not a policy, because nothing was going to happen there. Russia wasn't going to let something happen. But politically, you could say you were doing something. Um, and again, it's, it, I don't mean that as a criticism of uh, either party, because both parties engage in this. 
But the result was that it picked up steam, it got messier, et cetera. Um, the, the famous story of the boy, Al Khatib, the 13 year old uh, in March, two years ago, or 20 months ago, who was at a demonstration, taken away, delivered on his parents' doorstep two weeks later. His, uh, his, he was dead, he was wrapped in plastic and a blanket. Underneath his body was mutilated, his penis had been cut off and put in his mouth and left as a message to his parents and others. I think when that happened, it was pretty clear that Bashir al-Assad wasn't waiting to see what the UN said. He was gonna do ruthless things to stay in power. But there's no appetite to act and I'm sympathetic to it. But if we're gonna be successful, you need action earlier. And we've seen that in the Eastern Congo with the most recent activity of M23 rebel group. You see that, of course, in uh, Darfur. And you may be seeing that in Mali now as it gets worse and worse. Nancy, same question to you. I'd like you to talk a little bit about Syria, but you could also address some of the other conflicts that we've talked about, Congo, Mali. Uh, you know, from your perspective, from being both inside the government for many years and then also as a kind of an outside advocate, why is it so difficult to get, you know, action on dealing with these uh, issues? Well, I think largely I agree with Rich's comments, as he predicted, although I would disagree with the premise that this inaction in Syria is linked to fatigue in Libya and Iraq and Afghanistan. Had none of those happened, I don't think we would have been uh, doing a whole lot differently. In fact, we might have done less in a way that the contrast made us look at having to do uh, something. To this day, the only thing the U.S. has really done is call for Assad's regime to fall with no force to back that up and humanitarian aid and non-lethal aid to the opposition, which we haven't even recognized yet. France and the UK have. I think it's inevitable that we will, uh, and that over time, it looks like Russia's beginning to crack its uh, support of the regime. But I, I think that this is um, an example of where the world is in the responsibility to protect thing, which is still very much in a Westphalian um, society where the exception to the rule is the infringement on sovereignty, as we saw in Libya. Uh, as Rich said, Libya was a unique case where you had a madman, obviously, incredibly threatening to kill people and with no friends. And, and we intervened. Syria has two veto-wielding friends on the council, um, Iran and China, and has, um, I, I mean, uh, Russia and China, and has Iran as a very, very big, compl complicating regional power supporting it. And if you look at why, where is the state of the world in intervention? Yes, it's made some progress. Uh, less on the use of force than in the need to prevent. Uh, I think the best example of prevention was in the uh, 2008 case in Kenya, where that could have blown up and been a massive uh, military intervention. Instead, you had, you know, wise men, you know, from Africa going in and, and really stopping the conflict in a way that has has uh, gotten not as much um, attention. But I attribute sort of um, the, the challenges to the RTP to be three things. The first is what I call NMR, because everyone in Washington loves acronyms, not my responsibility. And to me, that's the hardest thing. The responsibility to protect says that if a state is unwilling or unable to deal with the problem, the responsibility falls to the international community, but who? And so until you have one country willing to stand up and really drive it, as we had in, in uh, France there, you're not going to have um, a, uh, a move um, forward. Um, secondly, I d this, this point of Westphalia, you really have um, countries not willing to cede sovereignty or infringe others' sovereignty, particularly those countries with human rights abuses to worry about at home, witness Russia and Chechnya or China with its multitude of human rights abuses. It's afraid of setting a standard um, there. And third, there's a new dynamic, particularly with the BRICS, um, coming up that they are deeply reluctant to authorize the use of force. If you look at who abstained on the resolution on Libya, the, the two BRIC countries that are not permanent members, Brazil and India, both abstained Germany. All three of those are likely to be eventually permanent uh, permanent members. And so until you can accommodate those three challenges, I don't 
think that um, RGP is going to be uh, used through the use of force. And what that leads me to think is, all right, over time that'll change. Um, but right now, that's the world in which we live. Um, it's still very much Westphalian. We're not in the post-Westphalian phase yet. So what does that mean in terms of uh, how can we, those who care about stopping uh, atrocities, it, it comes all about prevention. I, I'm having been in the White House during the Rwandan genocide, all of us who were there are haunted by our failure to stop that. Uh, but I'm not confident that the world has changed dramatically. Um, because there isn't a prevent genocide use of force that you can trigger within two weeks once the violence starts. Um, it's all about prevention. And so I think what we need to do is look at how you prevent um, conflict and how do you can do that while you're pushing the other, uh, the other issue. And I think the one, one thing that should be talked about at length here, and I understand Samantha's coming here this afternoon, and I'm sure she'll talk about that, is the Atrocities Prevention Board, which the President announced at your museum in, uh, in April. And what that does is have a series of um, good ideas which have yet to be implemented. I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, I have a number of ideas on how to make that stronger, which we can get into later. But I'll stop with your initial question All right, right there. Good. Well, I think actually for, for both of you, you've kind of teed up about half a dozen really good subjects for us to kind of drill down deep into. I would like to focus in on the question of prevention uh, from this perspective. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you have this conversation and we're having it today a little bit, you go immediately to the military intervention. And obviously, if you, in a full-blown crisis like Syria, you know, you're really talking about military options, all of which are probably bad, and it's about what the least bad options are. But what you really want to do, it seems to me, is really prevent these crises from metastasizing in the first place to the point where you're kind of confronted with these uh, really terrible options. So I would like to ask both of you, you know, both of you served in very senior positions in previous administrations. Are there lessons that you took away about non-kinetic options that really ought to be given more serious attention by the policy community? Uh, you mentioned, one, the kind of preventive diplomacy that was employed in, in, in Kenya in 2007, 2008. But are there other non-kinetic options that you think um, really could be uh, uh, focused on? I'd like to start with you, Nancy, and then come to you, Rich. And, and, and try, if possible, to speak from your own experience from, from being senior policymakers. Take your blinders off. Um, whenever you're in government, you are always under attack and you're always out there uh, defending whatever you've done because you obviously believe in it because you did it and it's really hard to step back and say all right maybe we're looking at this uh, the wrong way <coughs> um, and I noticed it with the Rwanda genocide I wrote a book about and went back and looked at all the original documents and really s dug in of what could we have done differently tried to be objective um, and one of the big mistakes that I took away from that and I've seen it repeated time and time again is don't get sidetracked by the little itty bitty progresses. In the Rwandan genocide, the, the, entire, the entire focus of our efforts was one, to protect American lives, and two, to get the peace process back on track, because if we were <coughs> able to get the peace process back on track, so at least the killing would stop. And so every little bit of progress that you could make, as peripheral as it was, um, that's the that's where everybody was focused went and meanwhile the genocide was going on so the first two weeks were talked about trying to get the Arusha process back on track while the genocide was just going on unabated and so I think those little things are great but don't be afraid to step back and say no that's a side uh, that's a sideshow here and the the larger issue comes um, we've also as you know since we've had these discussions uh, directly the I think the Atrocities Prevention Board is something that can be real. I think there are four things that need to be done to make it real. One is to give an executive order that's been expected from the White House, and I hope you'll ask Samantha where that stands when she comes this afternoon. I know they're working on it, but until you have an executive order embedding it, it's not necessarily clear to the agencies uh, what exactly it means and, and where it comes. Um, and that would really set out the priorities and everything else. Um, the challenge with the APB, as one official put it, is it's got to be in the serious deputies committee decisions or it becomes what one official told me, 
um, a cute little sideshow um, that people say, oh, we're worrying about that, but it really doesn't get into the options. And without that strong it press, um, you need it. Secondly, it doesn't have a budget. There's absolutely no money. Um, we need a stronger, the Complex Crisis Fund is starting it, the, the new Bureau for the um, conflict, conflict Stabilization Organization, but none of those are really funded appropriately or embedded uh, with a serious uh, staffing and budget that it needs. Um, uh, third, I think we could do more with the scenario toolkit. A lot of um, agencies that are involved in some of these decisions early on in prevention aren't briefed and socialized to the toolbox that exists in terms of the preventive. Um, and lastly, I think we ought to start building um, international APBs all over the world. We can't do it on our own. So what other countries do we want to have act that would also have the same similar, uh, the early warning signs? And Mike's right in that the R2P is far from a use of force only. That is very clearly stated in the doctrine of R2P that that's an absolute last resort. So it, embedded in it all these con conflict states that we need to be much more sensitized. The signs of crisis and genocide are there. Um, I would put on the table a big failure right now is Mali. Uh, a lot of conflict prevention organizations were <coughs> claiming that the Tuaregs would come back from the Libyan uh, mass very heavily armed and come back and it's just one double perfect storm of the government being overthrown and then the Tuaregs being overthrown now it's a terrorist safe haven in the north. So um, those pieces of it, I think, uh, of making the APB real and trying to internationalize it and always being able to sort of B-team your, uh, your own negotiations would go a long way. Rich, you, uh, you served in the Bush administration. President Bush, I know because I covered him, he was deeply concerned, you know, really almost obsessed with Darfur. He actually put the issue of, uh, of genocide prevention into the national security uh, strategy, I think, for the first time of any president. So this is a bipartisan issue. What did you learn from, from when you were the special envoy about uh, what we can do to put a greater focus on prevention? Well, I agree with, uh, there's nothing which I disagree about uh, Nancy's comments on process and procedure and structure. And that can be strengthened. But also, for any of you who served in senior government roles, there are so many friggin' processes, procedures going on. And it's gotten much worse at the NSC in the last two administrations uh, with the amount of time people send in principals committee and deputies committee meetings, et cetera, that uh, that's not a silver bullet. What was reaffirmed to me strongly was that we have to back up and say, what? Why do these things happen? And it happened in Sudan. It happened in Kenya. Happened uh, in Syria. Uh, as Professor Valenti from Dartmouth has written. Valentino. Valentino, excuse me. <laughs> um, powerful people make decisions to open the gates of hell to solve their problems. And they find that acceptable. And their motivations aren't much different than the people in Washington. How many members of Congress cast votes that they're sure will make them lose office? And how many votes do they cast that they don't believe in to stay in office? My point is only it's a natural inclination for people, including maybe particularly politicians, to want to seek office and once they're in it, to retain it. And what you have in these conflicts are people who uh, are willing to do things that we find abhorrent, we find unimaginable that you would unleash these forces. But to them, it's acceptable behavior. I met uh, in Kenya with the opposition leader in 07. Just as a little background, he'd cut a deal with the president in the election before that, where they were going to switch. It was kind of a coalition. They were going to switch uh, jobs after two years. The president reneged. So I can't remember his name. I apologize. Um, he said, so I'm going to challenge him, and I've got the votes. And if I don't, I'm going to unle unleash some economic, I mean, uh, ethnic trouble. And that's what he did. And I give uh, Ban Ki-moon and Kofi Annan credit, but they went in and basically cut an unconstitutional deal where the one guy was able to keep his president 
and the other guy became prime minister but all the powers. Now it stopped the fighting, and without that mediation, the fighting may not have stopped. But there was a conscious decision of what you'd do to try to change the political status. And clearly in Sudan, that was the same thing, a small group of people who had come to power in 89, and it's generally the same group of about 12 people, made a decision of how they were going to handle southern Sudan. Uh, and then when there were difficulties in Darfur, were willing to do it again. Now, there are a lot of factors that go into it. In uh, Darfur, you had uh, a spreading of the desert that made it more difficult for the Arab uh, uh, nomads, um, and therefore there were some more, the tensions were, were higher between them and the agricultural population, et cetera. But they lived for centuries with a minimum of violence. Somebody, some people in Khartoum said, no, no, let's go get that land and we'll help you. My point is, I think a lot of prevention has to go with making it unacceptable. And that means making the consequences much worse on people willing to do this. And I know in the case of Sudan, when um, <clears throat> there was a referral at the ICC for <clears throat> charges of genocide against uh, Omar al-Bashir, it had a real effect on that group of 12 people. And they didn't, you know, they were worried about their future. And so accountability is part of it. Part of it is coming up with other ways to pressure those folks. They still may make the decision, but let's make the calculation more dangerous. And, you know, let me just say, Omar al-Bashir, a week ago visiting uh, Morrissey in Cairo and being treated like a head of state when he uh, has an arrest warrant for genocide against him isn't helping us. Can I just press you on, on Sudan for a minute? Because that's actually, if you look at the last 20 years of the issue, I mean, there's been terrible atrocities. <coughs> Two million people dead in the North-South Civil War. Uh, uh, tens of thousands ki killed during the ethnic cleansing in Darfur. Now you have this terrible situation, which, which I would regard as one of the most serious situations in the world for, for, for human beings, which is a situation in, in the Nuba Mountains where there are reports that the uh, government of Sudan is obstructing you know, the delivery of, uh, of humanitarian aid. This is an ongoing problem, and there is not an appetite right now in the world for, for military action to deal with this. You know, from your experience, I mean, just be a little bit more specific about are there concrete things that, that you think have been effective that could be effective in dealing with that? I'd like to ask you that question, to think about the question, too. You know, the di one of the difficulties is the fatigue factor with Sudan. Secondly, um, there are some lessons to be learned in how we engage Sudan, where both the rebels in Darfur and um, the rebels, the SPLM, the government now of southern Sudan, became uh, of a view that the U.S. was their advocate, that they didn't have to give as much as they would otherwise. And, of course, a resistance from Khartoum for the same reason. Uh, when I was Special Envoy, I spoke and, and wrote and, and pushed both Khartoum and Juba to deal with the oil revenue sharing issue. And one of the most disappointing uh, experiences in my diplomatic career, and my first ambassadorship was 30 years ago, was that in the end it was southern Sudan that didn't want to cut a deal because they thought they could do better. And until you solved the revenue sharing, you weren't going to have peace in the border region. This was predictable. It was understandable. And the Bush administration failed and the Obama administration failed. Then when they approached the date of the referendum in the last uh, four months after being somewhat passive, the Obama administration gets great credit for being very engaged to allow the referendum to go forward in the separation. But the tough issue that would have given more sustainable peace kept being pushed aside, and it's, it continues to be a huge problem. And Juba and Khartoum will not have peace until they deal with this oil revenue issue. And there's a logic to it because the South can't get oil to the market without going through the North in the port of Sudan take a couple years to build uh, a pipeline, which they can't afford not to have the revenue flow. The North uh, has to segue off that dependency and could accept some type of uh, 
transfer fee. In other words, intellectually you could see it. Intellectually you could get both Salva Kerr and uh, Salah Ghosh and, and Omar al-Bashir to understand that. But once they got in the room because of the, all the baggage and the expectation of the role the U.S. would play, we failed. And I think it's a, it, we have to learn about that in the future of not allowing one side to think you're going to be their blind advocate. And whatever they can get, okay, you'll get 20% more. Um, and that's a failure of diplomacy by the U.S. And second, I always felt that the referendum should be used as a leverage to get the deal. But because of drift, the goal became just let's get through the referendum with peace and not deal with the tough issue. So I think it, it, indirectly the international community, the U.S., Norway, Britain in particular, deserves some responsibility for what's going on because the opportunity to deal with the underlying problem uh, was subsumed by let's just try to do the easy thing and get through the referendum. Nancy, do you have any thoughts about Sudan that you'd want to add to this? Um, well, Rich is the expert on that, and I think I would take it up a level in terms of some of the problems that he pointed out or how do you sustain U.S. engagement? I agree. I think President Bush actually deserves great credit for getting that deal. Uh, the Christian community here very effectively came to him and said, this, this is a, a problem for the Christians in the South, and he engaged and got the deal. And that kind of engagement at that level is very hard to sustain. The president's busy. Uh, but often, unless you have that presidential engagement, or at least the National Security Advisor or someone at the White House, um, there is a drift. And how many crises can you have do that? There's a few other things going on. I mean, I'm sure the president right now is thinking more about the fiscal cliff than he is about how to solve Sudan or Mali or the Congo. And I wouldn't, probably wouldn't argue that that's the wrong thing. So um, I think the, uh, it, it comes back to this, it's not my responsibility as well. How do you keep that sustained responsibility when the American public can't even find Canada on the map? Uh, it's right there, by the way, they're looking at it. Um, so I think in terms of um, you need to have a president, as we have, I think, now, and as we had in President Bush, particularly with respect to Sudan, a uh, commitment to try and address these issues and have a, and no one's more committed than this, than Samantha Power, but she can't do it on her own. So I would say educating the population, having the toolkits, even though they're bureaucratic, they do have a way of bubbling up. But all this stuff can bubble up, but without the presidential attention to it, or at least the deputies committee, um, it, not much is going to happen. Can I, can I comment Please. about advocacy issue? Because I think Sudan, to me, was an education. Uh, for a lot of reasons I won't go through, uh, it became a cause celeb with millions of people. Uh, movie Hotel Rwanda, the effectiveness of the internet used to people use of college campuses, but many of us have been in the advocacy community. And one of the lessons uh, I had was it could, the advocacy community helped make Sudan an issue. As Nancy said, it was really the churches that were most important. And it's very interesting because in 2000, or 1999 and 2000, they went to Episcopal churches in Tennessee and Methodist churches in Texas, the people that cared about Darfur. It worked. And it worked. They said, either one that won, we're going to find a way to get to them on a moral standing. And obviously it worked with President Bush. And so that was a very clever and effective advocacy. And when I became the special, President's Special Envoy, I mean, I got a million emails. I had to change my email address a few times. Uh, but that was very encouraging. All the, and the people on Capitol Hill. And so it was on the agenda but it couldn't push it from being on the agenda to mattering that much. You could have a Senator Menendez or a Johnny Isaacson or a Frank Wolf. There were a handful, Don Payne. But it, I don't know the answer, but from getting it on the agenda to really making it a more important priority, the failure in the end of the advocacy community to make it more costly for Washington not to act was a surprise to me when I was in that position because there were so many smart, well-intended, good people engaged in it. And I tried to coordinate and work with them to try to put pressure on the Hill or uh, on the administration. And the limits of that was very discouraging because I felt so strongly that we should stop the, the murder and mayhem and misery in Sudan. 
But I think that's also the nature of the presidency. And to me, you're not going to fundamentally change that except in rare circumstances. And so what I think is important to the community here that thinks about how to do the prevention piece of it is look at the regional uh, centers because the regions are the one who get it first and are most effective. So build up the AU preventive capacity. Latin America could you know, do its own probably. They're pretty sophisticated on it. Um, Asia perhaps could do more, but make it the responsibility of the regional organizations to act in a preventive manner. Because well, once you lose that battle, people are going to die. I'd like to actually follow up on that because a lot of our conversation so far has really focused on the U.S. responsibility. But if you look at how some of these crises have been resolved in the past, you know, starting in Rwanda where the genocide was ended by, the, you know, uh, Paul Kagame's military force or the... Uh, the, 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 the atrocities in Cambodia were ended by the Vietnamese, and the, the French took a very strong and leading role in, in resolving Ivory Coast, uh, which is another thing we and haven't Nigeria talked about. Nigeria actually solved right. uh, Sierra Leone without telling a soul in New York and so, just did it. Right. So the question really is, uh, both of you have really worked at the UN. Is there, over the next four years, a, an opportunity to engage other countries in this issue. I mean, it's a double-edged sword often with the United States, you know, because people don't like us throwing our weight around and, and, and react against it. But is there a way in a cooperative fashion to stimulate, you know, other countries to, to, to work on this issue with us? I think it's happening to a fair amount. And interestingly, through not just our State Department, but our military, is very involved in regions trying to train regional forces. There's not a lot of um, interoperability going, you know, among the various regions, and they're not being trained necessarily to UN standards, but it's a step in the right direction, which is really interesting. If in an ideal world, you'd have you know, the chapter A, regional authorizations to the AU to deal with Africa problems, you know, some group in, in Asia to do Asia, Latin America, the OAS, um, where the U.S. could provide assistance when necessary but not be the lead, and particularly not the lead political force. Um, NATO is pretty much already there, so, and it doesn't have to be NATO standards. But in each of these cases, um, a, you know, sort of, alarm goes off when you see the obvious sign. This, these are very rarely surprises. People may not be paying attention, but if you're paying attention, you could have predicted Mali, for instance. Um, and so devolving the responsibility for the alert and the initial response to the uh, regional organizations is a much sounder long-term plan than expecting the Oval Office to deal with every one of these issues. Rich, you have any thoughts about this issue from, the, from your perspective? No, no, I agree. I think um, Early engagement is the single most important thing. Um, and just that a lot of the so-called Pillar 1 activities are focusing on helping develop countries' capacity, economic, otherwise. And of course, as Nancy knows, in the UN, the majority of the countries always favor something that will get them more resources, so they're happy to have R2P. It only focuses on Pillar 1. Um, and that's good. It's good to strengthen the states and their capacities. Uh, but an early warning and a response and the acceptance that it's a lot cheaper to try to do it that way uh, is important and you need lead countries and um, the U.S. I think has to mature where you can be the lead country without committing as many resources. Can and I get you guys to disagree on anything? Well, we disagreed on November 6th. <laughs> <laughs> and why? <laughs> well, the, which isn't, I mean, I think the, there is, and you're going to hear from Senator McCain shortly, this is not a partisan issue, largely. Um, it, it, there are Democrats and Republicans who feel very passionately about this issue, and Rich has devoted much of his life to it, for which we're all indebted. Um, but the country itself isn't necessarily on board with it. We're part of the elite inside Washington that gets it, but you go, you know, the, if you poll these issues, nobody wants the U.S. to be the world's policeman, and that's not going to change, <coughs> particularly in the middle of a global recession. So how can you long-term plan to embed responses on prevention? And that's why I think we should internationalize the APB and institutionalize it ourselves, but also export it. There are there's, there are indicators that are very obvious before a crisis occurs. And so how, how do you highlight those at a regional level very quickly? And the UN, 
um, is actually pretty good at some of this stuff too and we should work more closely to listen to those UN reports when they come in because they almost always get it right and nobody pays attention. All right, we're going to try to throw the, this open to the group and see if you have any questions. Uh, so think of some questions in the next two minutes. I want to ask one other question uh, before, just very quickly. I'd like to know from both Rich and uh, Nancy about the role of Congress in particular. Uh, you know, a lot of these reforms recently have been driven by executive branch. Um, uh, you know, you tend to have people like Senator Brownback or, or Congressman Wolf who tend to focus on like specific issues like, you know, uh, Congressman Wolf is very interested in Sudan, traditionally has been a big champion of trying to do more for the people of Sudan. But on a systemic basis, uh, would you have recommendations for the next Congress to deal with this? Are there things, is there a piece of legislation, for instance, that they could push that would really help, uh, you know, kind of consolidate some of these uh, things that are going on in atrocity prevention? Because I think one important thing is, we, you know, we don't want this stuff to just be in one administration. You know, what, with Clinton actually set up an interagency process at the end of the Clinton administration and it kind of went away under President Bush. So these things, we would like to have a longer shelf life. What is the role of, of Congress? Well, I think uh, you're correct. Uh, members of the House and Senate by nature are going to deal with specific issues, crisis as opposed to systemic and procedural stuff. There's not a lot of political money to be made for most members of Congress by talking about uh, reform procedures. My own view, though, is first the engagement of Congress is very important. And when you have people like Menendez or Wolf, um, Don Payne, it makes a difference. And it makes a difference when you're the point person in an administration for it that you have those people. And you can encourage them to express themselves in ways that uh, make sure that others in the administration appreciate there's that interest. But second, I think um, just like uh, there was a significant, I think if you look back in the human rights advocacy progression, the Carter administration deserves great credit for pushing for an annual report on human rights in the, every country. And it forced its next administration, Reagan, who eventually became a pretty strong supporter of the Human Rights Bureau, but not initially, to have something they had to put on, they had to come out in March with this report. And I think that was a good thing. And among other things, it forced every po U.S. post in the world to do their own human rights report that was sent to Washington. And so it institutionalized um, consideration of human rights, it embedded it in U.S. policy, and it gave an event once a year where it, there was attention both on Capitol Hill but also within the press. I think there should be a similar thing with respect to atrocities. And I think Congress should pass a law uh, making a requirement for the State Department to issue an annual report. It may not be nearly as successful as the Human Rights Report, but as I look back, and you know, uh, including when I was ambassador to the Human Rights Commission, that report was very, it was fascinating to me how it changed the bureaucracy and it uh, adapted. And uh, if you're an FS3 in Moscow, you're pro and you're assigned to pull that together, your future, your promotion, your, your review by the panel depends on how well you do. So you take it seriously and do it. And so I think that is a particular specific step Congress could do that could have a long-term effect, even though it may not be uh, an immediate eureka moment. Do you have a specific suggestion for Congress? Um, that's actually an interesting idea, but I don't know why you couldn't have a, the human rights report could just have here are the genocide indicators and report on them as part of that as well. Extrapolate them, because they do report on them, but not in terms of here's the genocide watch list. It could be very interesting. Um, I, Congress is, um, is crucial to it and usually on the wrong side. Um, it usually is dragging down the complex crisis fund, the office of the new stability operations. They just don't fund it. They don't see it. I think it's gotten a little better after 9-11 um, because it's not an accident that Osama bin Laden went to two failed states, Sudan and then Afghanistan. And so there is a sense that these things now in the age of um, 
terrorism have a direct link to the U.S. security. So if you can sell it in terms of if we don't pr prevent this crisis, terrorists will show up, they might be willing to fund it. But they're way lagging behind their responsibility on this, and they need to step up to the plate and are key. Absolutely. That's why it falls to the president. And the poor State Department's running around trying to find funds for the Kenyan intervention. Um, that's ridiculous. So they absolutely have to step up. All right. Any questions for our panelists? Uh, shoot your hand up, and uh, I will uh, recognize you. Any thoughts? <coughs> Any critiques? Back there. We have a microphone coming after you. Thanks very much. It's on, right? Yeah. My name is Kristen Broker. I work for the Jacob Blaustein Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights, and we've been active on this issue for for a while i i appreciated both the panelists comments today and especially the suggestion that uh response to mass atrocities be delegated in a sense to regional organizations where possible and i think that's a lot of capacity there that could be utilized better than it has been <coughs> one big risk that comes up is the risk of course that human rights standards aren't going to be adhered to at all in the way you'd hope when some regional organizations take over, at least at this point. I mean, I'm thinking of plans right now for, you know, the, the plan for the Security Council on Mali doesn't involve necessarily ECOWAS anymore. Maybe it'll be using the Malian armed forces to go back after being trained by the French and others. But how can the U.S. ensure that relying on regional organizations doesn't come at the expense of the kind of intervention or early warning that would violate human rights standards in a way that makes it counterproductive to engage. Thanks. Nancy, you want to start? Uh, you can't ensure anything in foreign policy. Um, and so that is a definite risk. And all you can do is uh, admit it up front and try and accommodate it. And you might have to make some tough choices. Uh, <coughs> in Mali, the ECOWAS troops claim to be ready to go up and take back the North. No one thinks they have the capacity to do so. The Malian army certainly doesn't. But could they do something good to try and tip the balance there? Most people think that unless you've got some NATO help, that's not going to work. So I don't, it's not clear to me how that's going to uh, play out. My guess is the French will go in and try and beef them up and help ECOWAS do it. Um, but I think the... That's not a reason not to involve the international regional players. It's a reason to take a long-term uh, effort and to train them starting now, not two months before the intervention is supposed to occur, but look at it long-term. And I think to a certain extent we're doing that. We have a, an AFRICOM, it's still weirdly up in Germany, but um, you know, they, there is a four-star command that looks at this, and General Ham is actually doing, I think, a pretty good job in trying to promote the need to do more on the continent. Um, and here again, Congress needs to step up and, and help as well. But it's certainly a risk, but not a reason for inaction. Rich? First, uh, please say hello to my good friend Felice Gear, and thanks for the question. I'm a cynic. How many NATO countries contributed to the Libyan R2P exercise. 27 countries in NATO, six participated. The largest European country and the wealthiest, Germany, sat on the sidelines. I think we have to be realistic. Uh, I think it's easy when, uh, I think there's a tendency when you're sitting here and looking on the stresses of the U.S. to say, oh, yeah, but there's this pool out there that can do it. And I'll tell you one other story that captures the politics of the local situation. Omar al-Bashir was relatively isolated. He had twice tried to become head of the AU. He had been stopped. He was embarrassing. But as soon as the uh, chief prosecutor made a referral on, uh, on an arrest warrant for Omar al-Bashir, the ICC did what no one else had, which is to unify sub-Saharan African support of Omar al-Bashir. And they tried to uh, get an Article 19 to suspend jurisdiction of the ICC. And I remember being in uh, Addis at a meeting of the AU Committee um, on Peace, 
security and having all these ambassadors tell me that they all were going to, how terrible this was. Now, you and I both know why they thought it was terrible, because they figured their own governments were doing some of these atrocities and they might be next. Uh, the big threat was 32 countries would leave the ICC if it went forward, to which I said, well, I'm from the Bush administration. If they do, please give, them, give me credit. Uh, the point is, uh, the abstract is not where this is done with. It's done with a specific case by case. I think it's important to build the regional organizations, to call on them, but it is not a panacea, and the U.S. is not going to be able to offload this on local uh, regional organizations. Some are better. Latin America is a good example. But uh, we should try to build their capacity. We should work with them. We should try to engage them. But I don't think we should overstate how much they're going to actually do. But you also, it's not all about the military. They are certainly, the ICC wasn't about the military. Right, it was about they, a legal in, action. In terms of action. the, but in terms of the capacity to, um, to to step up in some of these cases, I think they're uh, they're certainly capable of doing a better job. Like on the OSCE, what, where was it in Georgia? Um, and we shouldn't let them get off the hook. I, I don't think we should anticipate much of a military operation. And Africa is still stuck in the 1960s anti-colonialism mentality far too much in many areas. But, um, you know, there's a lot that can happen before you get to the use of force that isn't happening right, right. now. Right. Let, but let me also just, because Nancy's raised some disagreement. This is so. good, good. I like disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I was going to say Nancy raised a really good point that I just want to emphasize oh, on, on the military capacity. <laughs> you know, ECOWAS <laughs> did a terrific job when Cote d'Ivoire had its first fighting in uh, the fall of 02. It was driven by France who had client interests in Cote d'Ivoire. But the actual transportation and communications, the U.S. had to deliver. We have to be realistic about the capability of militaries in the world today. I love my, my favorite example is in, in uh, Afghanistan when Germany said, okay, they'd help train police. They had to rent two planes from Ukraine to move their troops. Be realistic about what the capabilities are, and the result is the U.S. is going to continue to have a heavy burden. And one of the things I give Bush a lot of credit for is he devoted $200 million to training peacekeepers in nine countries and moving them to uh, Darfur, um, which was a way to get the African troops that were trained. But the countries that did it weren't because they cared about peacekeeping. I remember a discussion with Mellis in Addis, and it was about how many night site uh, equipment he was going to get for various of his helicopters. For them, they were getting free military upgrade. Uh, again, I just want to say, U.S. isn't going to be able to offload this. Uh, the U.S. is going to have to carry a heavy motion. Hopefully, we can come be better at burden sharing, engaging others, developing capacity. But I think it's unrealistic to feel that these things are going to get done without the U.S. leadership, including material and uh, support. And, and that's whether it's military or otherwise. All right, I think we have time for maybe one, one or two more questions. I see two here. Why don't I just uh, collect some questions quickly, and then we'll close. Uh, th those three, them, you, and then you, and then. Uh, I'm Mary Ann Stein with the Fund for Global Human Rights, um, and I'm a, definitely a novice at th this issue. But I wonder if um, you panelists have any thoughts about moving um, some of the thoughts about solution back even farther than picking up the signs, not that we shouldn't do what you're suggesting about picking up the signs of atrocities, but looking at um, potential conflicts um, over resources or um, ethnic conflict or whatever it is, and, and looking at whether there are any international, possible international entities or mechanisms that could be brought to bear even sooner than as the atrocities are building To up. deal with the right. issue of resources? Right. Okay, I think, well, by the way, I not think... Not just resources, but... Are we, we're out of time, various. basically. So maybe, uh, I, I, I'm going to have to... This is a, that's going to have to be the last question, because I think Senator McCain is here to give his keynote address. So maybe Nancy and Rich can just answer Marianne's question very quickly. And I'm sorry to the other two questions, uh, uh, but 
shoot. No, no, uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is yeah. it basically to try and see whether or not we could have some uh, earlier efforts to resolve the resources conflict? Well, I, uh, all of these conflicts that we're talking about are uh, have causes, um, some of them very long-seated, ethnic conflicts, land conflicts, resource conflicts. And I'm just wondering whether there is, um, whether you have thoughts about looking, creating some kind of a mechanism or an entity or whatever it might be that would pick things up even before they're Okay. They're at yeah, the, I think, the stage I mean, you've, you've to, been talking about. I mean, that's at the heart of any conflict negotiation. Unless you deal with the heart of the conflict, as Rich was pointing out in Sudan, it's going to bubble up again. You can put a, call, a lid on the smoldering fire, but eventually it's going to boil over. So unless you um, want to keep intervening over and over again, you've got to resolve the underlying conflicts. One of my fears of Afghanistan is that we're going to leave before we solve the underlying problems, which is the total lack of development in that country. And as one general said, leapfrog it from the 14th to the 17th century would be the big success. Um, but I want to say thank you for that. And whatever Rich says, I fundamentally disagree with whatever he's about to say. So <laughs> thank you very much for everyone. Do you have anything you want to say, Rich, in closing? No, just, uh, you know, the, the administration deserves credit for what they've done on sustainable agricultural development. It's a constant um, uh, battle to try to help countries come up to the 21st century. But the type of conflicts where there are atrocities are not because of um, climate. They're not because of decade-old um, ethnic uh, tensions. They're because somebody decided it was in their interest to start these terrible events. All right, I want to thank Human Rights First. Uh, read their Enablers Report. I forgot to put that <laughs> little plug for that. Uh, it's an important subject. And I really want to give a round of applause to Nancy and Rich for a really thought-provoking and great discussion. Thank you. That was fun.